Hello there, my name is Paul Hudson and this is Project One of Hacking with Swift, in which you'll learn a great deal about Swift coding and also have a brief introduction to UIKit, which is the iOS development framework from Apple. For more information, see the website hackingwithswift.com, where you can buy all the books in this series as well as high-res videos. The books go into far more detail than these videos, so do check them out. You can also find me on Twitter, I am at Two Straws. If you have any questions or suggestions or problems, let me know, I'll do my best to help you. Okay, let's begin. Down here in your dock, I have Xcode 6.2 beta. Hopefully by now the final version is out and you have it installed. If not, please go to the Mac App Store and install it now. Go ahead and launch Xcode and it'll ask you what you wanna do. Uh, please choose create a new Xcode project. Here are the templates we can work with. Uh, please choose iOS, application, master detail application, then click next. For the name, please call it project one. The organization name is your name. So you can just put in your name or I had Hadzilla. We could put in uh, Big Corp Inc, whatever your company name is. I don't really mind. Something that identifies you personally. It's hardly actually you, so it doesn't really that matter. Um, the next one is org identifier. This should be your personal domain name in reverse, cunningly. If you have no domain name, then just com.example. Otherwise, com.yoursite uh, is fine. I'll be using com.hackingwithswift because this is hackingwithswift.com. Next, choose language Swift because this is not hacking with Objective-C. Uh, for devices, please choose iPhone. And here, where it says use core data, make sure that is not checked. Make sure that is not checked for anything in all of this series. We will not use core data at all because it's quite confusing for beginners. So please make sure it's not checked. Now click next. It'll ask you where you want to save it. So I'll choose my desktop and click create. And there we go. It'll create a basic template project for us using the master detail template. Nothing fancy at this point. To begin with though, I want you to run the app as it is to make sure it works correctly. Up here you'll see the words iPhone 6 or perhaps something else for you. Clicking on that lets you choose an example device to work with. So there's 6, 6 Plus, 5S, 5 and so forth. Uh, I'm gonna choose the 5S. The 5S is a particularly good device to work with. It's very fast and it's very common. So I'll choose iPhone 5S. Now press this play button, this triangle in the top left corner and your code will be compiled, converted from Swift into native iOS machine code, then run inside this iOS simulator. And this is what Apple's built-in master detail thing gives us. Uh, an edit button, a plus button that when it's tapped, introduces uh, dates, I'll add loads of them into a table. I can scroll around, I can uh, delete some, click on edit, and then go you, I don't want you, and you, I don't want you, press on done. And then I can tap on one of these to bring up a new view, uh, which shows that date just by itself. And it rotates neatly. Fantastic. That is our basic application. This thing here is a table view. Uh, they are very, very common in iOS land. You'll see them in many applications, such as uh, the Contacts app, for example. They're all over the place, or Settings app. Um, this is our basic application, and what you've done is you've proven that your Xcode and iOS simulator is all working correctly. You'll be doing this all the time, running apps all the time. So there are three key pro tips you should know. Uh, first is you can just press Command R on your keyboard to press the play button. So run is just Command R. To stop, uh, see it's running right now. Up here it says running. To stop, press Command period or Command full stop, and it stops it. Oh, got a project. Uh, stop down here, command period. Uh, and for you, you can also, uh, while you're running, so press command R to run. If you're back to Xcode and press command R again to run while you are already running, it will give you an alert saying, wait a minute, you're running already. Um, so make sure, say, uh, do not show this message again, then press continue and you'll be fine. Um, and it just means you don't have to press command stop very many times, just press command R to rerun it where you left off. So this project is all about letting users select images. Uh, so you should have got the files for this project from hackingwithswift.com already. If not, please grab them now. I have them here in my desktop, project one files. And you'll see in there a load of JPEGs 
from the National Severe Storm Laboratory, NSSL. And I'll just quick look at these so you can see, you know, there's some clouds, some other clouds, lots of clouds, tons of clouds. It's a cloudy thing, it's a storm. Uh, there are some, there we go, look at that, slightly scarier clouds, but basically lots of scary uh, clouds. Um, I'm going to take this entire thing here and I'm going to copy it into my program directly. So I'm going to rename this folder to be content so it matches what you'll have in your download. And I'll drag that straight from Finder into Xcode under where it says supporting files and let go. This screen appears, choose options. Now you have to get these options correct, otherwise it will not work. So this is on my screen, the exact layout you want. Copy items if needed should be checked, good. Uh, create groups should be chosen and not create folder references. Choose create groups and leave add target alone. Now click finish and content will appear inside Xcode like that. It'll have a yellow icon next to it. That is what you want. If you see a blue icon, you've done it wrong, please try again. The first thing we're going to do is really simple. Choose master view control Swift. We are going to delete some code. Deleting code is a really easy way to get going in your program quite nice and quickly. So look for where it says view did load and you'll see these three lines of code. Left bar button item, a new add button and right bar button item. Just delete all three of those code, code lines. If you are not, by the way, seeing these uh, line numbers, they are very helpful later on. Um, so I do suggest you enable them. If you have not got them, go to Xcode, Preferences, then Text Editing, then Line Numbers. You want them on. It makes your life so much easier later on. So zap those three lines from view to load, which is great. Uh, a bit further down, you'll see this thing here, Funk Insert New Object. Just select all that funk down to this close brace or close curly brackets, you're that kind of person. You're wrong, it's a brace. Uh, just select it all and delete it. Then much further down, you'll see even more stuff. You'll see can edit row at index path and commit editing style. Select from there all the way down to the end, like that. Not the very last brace, just that lot. And delete those two methods entirely. Funk, by the way, is short for function. Uh, what they are really are methods. Functions and methods are very similar things with only one meaningful difference in Swift uh, when it comes to actually writing code, and we'll get onto that much, much later. So we've deleted those methods. We're going to make a couple more deletes here, uh, well, three exactly, um, before we're ready to go. The first here is inside this table view, cell for our index path method. You'll see as NS date. Please select that and delete that. And just beneath, it says dot description. Select that and delete that. So it just says object. And then finally, in the prepare for segue method, and it is segue, not seg or some other hideous pronunciation. Think of the motorized scooter. In prepare for segue, you will also see as ns date. Just zap that bit. And this gets our uh, code in a really great place. This is where we want it to be so we can start writing our own code on top. So this project, again, to remind you, is going to show a list of these pictures in that table view where those dates were. And the user is going to have to tap on one of them and see the picture full size on that other detail view. To do this, we're going to use some new data types built into iOS uh, because we need to try and find the names of these pictures. Now, you could, of course, see whether well, it's NSSL0033, so you can just write in, you know, uh, NSSL0033, which is fine for a small project. You might want to do that. But we could have a 1,000 pictures in here, lots of cloudy pictures, lots of cloudy days. And it wouldn't work so well for that. So we're going to take a bit of a shortcut. We're going to get the list of JPEGs inside our program and make our list from that instead. Now, this is really easy to do. Because uh, when you build your app, when you compile and run your program, all this code here gets turned into native machine code for iOS, which is cool. But all the assets you include get copied along as well, including some things you haven't made, such as you know your launch screen zip or uh, this info plist file. They all get put into the final build of your program into what's called a bundle. It's a, it looks like a dot app as its extension. It's a directory with an extension, like a file extension. Uh, your app name dot app. It's a directory full of stuff, including your program and these JPEGs. And we can actually grab that bundle, pull things out, and say, hey, which which files inside you have the prefix? They start with 
NSSL. Find those and put that into an array we can show inside the table. So inside viewed did load, you'll see it says super viewed did load. That just means, uh, well, first off, viewed did load is called by iOS automatically when your layout, when your designs finish loading from this uh, elsewhere, and it's finished loading. What do you want to do? And the first thing you do is call super viewed did load, which says, uh, listen, iOS, my views finished loading. You go ahead and do what you want to do, and then. I'll do other stuff. And there's comments in here from Apple, do any additional setup after loading the view. That's where we're gonna write our code. Now realistically, behind the scenes, super view did load does nothing, but that's okay. You wanna call these super things all the time just to make sure if iOS does have anything to do, it is doing it correctly. So I'll delete this comment, that's the slash slash stuff, this bit here, delete that. And I'm gonna write some code for you just quickly and then walk you through exactly what it does. So first, we'll use this let fm equals ns file manager dot default manager. What we're seeing here is the let keyword, which is Swift's way of de declaring a constant. A constant is a value that cannot change once it's been set. Swift coders love constants far, far more than any other coding language I've seen before. Uh, and they are actually very helpful because they, they are sort of promise. Don't let me change this again. Because if you try and change this constant later on, so I've called it fm for file manager. If I try and make fm equal to a, another file manager, you will see a complaint. Xcode's complaining. I cannot assign to let value fm. So by using the let keyword, we're telling this uh, Swift, this is never going to change, never let it change, and it will enforce that for us. It's very, very helpful. So let declares constants. fm is the name of the constant. I'll delete this broken line of code and equals assign to, uh, and we set it to be nsfilemanager.defaultmanager. First up, nsfilemanager. So ns, if you know your Apple history, uh, it's short for Next Step, which is a company that Jobs was behind, Steve Jobs, which then got sort of merged into uh, Apple and eventually became OS X, the operating system. Uh, and there are a lot of things underlying the way iOS works that come directly from desktop Mac OS X, which in turn comes from next step, NS. So you'll see lots of these NS things around the place. They're very, very common. If you don't care Apple history, meh, just forget the NS. It's required, but you don't have to care what it means. It's the NS. This thing though, the file manager, NS file manager, is a special data type that lets us work with files on the disk, on the SSD inside your iPhone and your iPad. And it can create files, it can read files, it can write files, it can delete files, you name it. It's great for working with files. But we don't care what kind of file manager we use, we just say default manager. Give me whatever file manager works best, it's lying around, I just wanna use that. So to recap, this thing says get the standard file manager and put it into FM so we can start using the file manager. Question is, what files do we want to work with? Well, on your iOS device, there are, of course, lots of directories, lots of folders. We've got no idea where they are, or what the structure is, or where our app is. But we need to know where our app is so we can start reading these JPEGs. Fortunately, Apple has a built-in way of saying, hey, please find my app bundle. That's a .app directory. Find wherever it is and tell me where its resources are, where its JPEGs are. Let's look at that now. We're gonna write let path, so again, making a new constant called path, equals nsbundle.mainbundle.resourcepath. Now let's look at this line more carefully. Yes, declare uh, constant, make it named path, good. nsbundle is a new data type, and it's designed to handle any kind of bundles of stuff like a dot app. There are other kinds, but like a dot app. And main bundle is a built-in way of saying, find my app, wherever that is, you know, whatever my app bundle is, give it to me. And it, it sorts out all the problems of where it lives in the file system or how you find it or you know, whether it's uh, available to you or not. You don't know. This thing just, just says, just find it for me wherever it is. And finally, resource path says, tell me where the JPEGs are. Bluntly, that's what happens. Uh, behind the scenes, when you build your app, this content folder goes away, the supporting files goes away, you just get all your things in one big directory. And that directory, wherever it lives on your iOS file system, 
resource path will tell us. But there's a slight hiccup, and the slight hiccup is this thing. And we'll be going back to this in five minutes, in 10 minutes, in an hour, again and again and again, uh, because it's not easy, but it is important, sadly. Uh, you see, resource path, where our JPEGs exist for our app bundle, might not exist. We don't know. We really don't know. It probably exists because, you know, the app's running. It's obviously, it, it probably exists, but it might not. And in Swift, there are three ways of working with, with data types. One is to write the data type directly. Uh, one is to write data type with exclamation mark at the end. And one is with a question mark at the end. And they all mean subtly different things. Exclamation mark in this case means we are pretty darn sure that resource path exists. Please let us go on using it. We'll come back to this again uh, with question mark and exclamation mark shortly. Don't worry, we'll go into much more detail until you really, really understand it. And it will become clear uh, as you're using it more and more. So don't worry too much. Anyway, that will find the resource path for our bundle and put it into the path constant. Next up, we want a new uh, uh, constant called items. So let items. What we're going to do is we're going to use this fm constant here, which is a file manager, to get the contents of a directory at this path. And that's done by saying fm.contents of directory at path. This is code completion in action, by the way. This is Xcode telling me what it thinks I want to write, and it's correct. I want contents of directory at path. Press enter to complete the code for you, and it'll say fine. I'll give you the contents of a directory at path, but what path do you want? Because you could read anything technically, obviously you're sandboxed on iOS, but what directory do you want? So delete what's there, and we're gonna write in path because we already know which directory we care about because that we found it out from our app bundle. So pass in path here. And finally for error, NS error point is a whole new data type which we're gonna come back to much later, but for now we don't care about it. We don't care if it went wrong or not because we know it's gonna work. That's not great behavior in a large project, but for project one, it's perfectly fine. So I want you to write in place of NS error pointer, N-I-L, nil. We don't care about the error. We'll come back to that other projects and do much better work, but for now it's perfectly fine. So this will pull out the file names of the directory at the path that is our app bundle. And I put that thing into here as an array, an array being a collection of objects. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through this array, this items array, using a new uh, structure in Swift called a for loop. So we're gonna write after that for item in items, oops, items, open brace. And this loop, it very simply, it goes over everything in the items array, then executes this code using this constant. So it'll pull out the first item, put it in here, execute this code, everything between that brace and that brace. Pull out the second item, put it in the item, execute code, third item, item, code, fourth item, item, code, and so forth. So we know that when this anything executes here, we'll have an item from the items array, we should do something with it. Now it's warning us, there's a big error here actually, a big red error, I am not gonna work. And the reason is because, uh, sadly, uh, contents of directory at path, this method we're calling here, returns an array of any object. We don't know that it happens to be uh, file names. So we have to tell it, actually, items is an array of file names. This is commonly the case with some of these older uh, Apple APIs. Much of the newer stuff, it will say explicitly, it returns lots of strings. But right now, it's any object. So we have to tell Swift that items is actually an array, a collection of text strings, file names. And to do that, you say as, then square bracket, string with a capital S square bracket. This square bracket syntax enclosing a data type, in this case, string, means array of string. You'll see up here, you'll see square bracket any object. It's an array of any object types. But for here, I have to say, listen, items, it is an array of strings. It's a load of file names. We want to loop through each one, put each file name into item, and then execute some code. What code? Well, we need to try and uh, make an array of all pictures that begin with NSSL, because they all do so far, which is fantastic. And that is easy to do using a conditional statement. We can say 
if the item dot has prefix, if it starts with the letters, quote, NSSL, quote, parentheses, open brace, like that. So we now have open brace and another open brace. What that means is pull out each file name from the array, put it into item. For each item, if it starts at NSSL, do something. In this case, we want to say objects dot append item. Now, what is this objects array? Well, actually, this comes from our Xcode template. It's up here. It is. It's a variable var dot constant let a variable var called objects, which is an array of any object. And the, these uh, double parentheses mean just create it straight away. It's a little shortcut. We'll see, we'll see that quite a lot. So this this now loops over every file name. If it starts with NSSL, it adds it to the array, which is exactly what we want, really. Uh, now, what we do know now is that our array is always going to be strings. This thing, we're always appending strings to this because we're, we're making sure that items is an array of strings. So we append a string to objects, string being a text string, so letters like a file name. So the, the definition of objects, which is currently any object, is, is inaccurate, or at least incomplete. Any object could be a string. It could be an NS file manager, an NS bundle, we don't know. If we say it's an array of string, it means now objects can only hold things that are strings. It's another promise. We're telling Swift, listen, if I try and put a, a dog in there or some popcorn or a pencil, don't let me. So it helps Swift make sure your code is valid. So that is our change so far. You can go ahead and run the project and be prepared to be wowed with the amazing excellence. Uh, you'll see the file names working correctly from uh, NS File Manager. And you can tap on one of those and see the file name in the detail view, which is it's better because we're now not just seeing uh, dates and such, but it's still quite lame because we really want to see this picture rather than some text. So to do that, we're going to introduce something called Interface Builder, which is the Xcode way of designing layouts. You'll see on the left here the main.storyboard file. Go ahead and choose that, and that will load uh, the layout for this project. So here is my storyboard. Uh, it's got a very poor view by default. It's not great coding from Apple, to be honest with you. Um, I have to pan around to try and see stuff. There we go. Or I can just sort of uh, uh, right click and choose zoom to 50% to really see a slightly more zoomed out view of my app. Uh, there we go, I can hide all that stuff and hide that stuff and there is my layout. So this is a visual layout of how the thing looks to users. Starting with the navigation control on the far left, that's this uh, bar along the top and also this whole animation thing moving in and out of view controllers like that. In the middle is a table view, that's the thing that scrolls around with the pictures. And then the right is our detail view. It's just got some a text thing in the middle. That's this label here. You can see it looks like that. This layout is encapsulated entirely inside a storyboard. Uh, there's no code required to make the storyboard. It's all done visually, which is fantastic because it means your layout, your views, the thing visually uh, available to users is separated from your functionality. It's such a control to application which makes life much easier. You can give the storyboard to a, uh, your ace designer, keep the code of yourself, and you can both work on the same project at the same time, which is fantastic. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify this to work better for um, our application by removing this whole label and replacing it with an image, which is much, much better. To do that, uh, double click on the detail view controller. This one's this one here on the far right to zoom in. And you'll see a label in the middle saying detail view content goes here. Just select that and delete it because it's useless. Then in the bottom right of your Xcode window is this thing, the object library. If you have not got it selected, do so now. You may see it's got this file template library or a snippet library. The third one along is the object library. You can find it if it's missing already. Got the object uh, library. There we go. Just press that button there. What is that? Con Control Alt Command 3, boom. So one, two, three, brilliant. It will show that if it's hidden already. 
You may have it on icon mode, which looks like this. Please don't, it's more confusing for beginners. Make sure it's on list mode like that. We want to place an image view into there to show an image inside that. So at the bottom of the object library is a search area. Just type image. And it'll filter based for that and you'll see image view. Click and drag that and hover over your view controller and then let go when it's centered. You see it snaps the blue dotted lines, it snaps like that and it fills the thing entirely and let go. Now you'll see it does go behind this navigation bar and that's perfectly okay. We'll come back to that later. And that is our image view ready to be customized. It's important you position it like that because we're now going to add something amazing called auto layout. This is a very big, complicated topic, which we'll do more later, much more later, trust me. But for now, we're going to do some really simple stuff. If you look at this view controller, you'll see it's square. This whole layout thing is square. Now, you've probably never seen a square iPhone, neither have I, or need a square iPad. They don't exist. That's because this design area, this canvas, is supposed to be an abstract view of all possible iPhones and iPads. It's not shaped like an iPhone. It makes you think about relationships between these views rather than exact coordinates. And the relationships in this case for us is this image view should always stay to the top and to the right and to the left and to the bottom of this view control of this, this screen because we don't want it to ever have any space. You know, if the user rotates, just keep on stretching it. If on an iPad, just stretch fill the iPad. On an iPhone 4, stretch down to fill the iPhone 4. Always stick to the edges no matter what. And to do that, we're going to use auto layout. Auto layout is, is black magic, quite frankly, but it's very powerful black magic, and it's usually your friend, uh, as long as you abide by its two rules. The first rule is your layout rules, which are called constraints, must be complete. For example, if I try and make a layout rule for this thing that says, listen, I want you to, to uh, center horizontally in your container image view, select that, you get this massive color going on, a big orange line going all the way around, orange line in the middle, a red arrow pointing out here, which says, no, you need constraints here, here, and here. It's just wrong. That's because I've told it a, a, a constraint, center horizontally, but I haven't told it any other constraints. So it's not fully specified. It's getting confused. It needs more information. Secondly, your rules must not conflict. If you say, listen, uh, image view, I want you to, to uh, always be a, a thousand wide, including on iPhone 5, that ain't gonna work because the iPhone 5's width is uh, 320 points across. Uh, that's not enough to occupy that space. So the auto layout simply cannot satisfy your rules. So it tries to break them to try and resolve the situation and it never works correctly. So you never want that to happen. So realistically, your rules must not conflict. So A must be complete, B must not conflict. I'm going to go ahead and delete that broken constraint and add some real constraints using this really anonymous button down here. There's four small auto layout buttons down here that are very cool. And you want a second one, which is a pin menu. Choosing that pops up some options. Please deselect constraints and margins. Then click on these red dotted lines. One, two, three, four. That will pin this image view to the edges of its container at zero, 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 zero no space click add four constraints and you'll see now a blue line appears all the way around this image view has valid auto layout constraints which is good it means you can start using it but we can't work with it in code just yet we've drawn on the screen fantastic but we haven't got a reference to it in code and to do that we need something new something called a property properties are just like constants and variables except they're attached to things you see, this entire time, I've been talking about view controllers. I haven't really explained what they are. If I zoom out to a long way, there we go. We've got three things here. On the far left, a navigation controller. In the middle of the table view, that scrolling thing we saw. Uh, this thing, table view. And on the right is our detail view, which just right now shows a label. These, all three of these things are called view controllers. And the view controllers an iOS concept, a really core, important, basically fundamental iOS concept, which is equivalent to, on iPhone, a screen of data. On iPad, you can have two view controllers side by side. And of course, you could do an iPhone, but most, most folks don't. Um, unless it's iPhone 6 Plus, I guess. But anyway, um, you can do it side by side, like the Mail app or the Settings app have has a thing on the left and a thing on the right. And a view controller does things like this rotation. 
it understands how to do rotation for you automatically. So they're very, very helpful, and they're usually defined on iPhone one screen of content. Now, a property is a variable or a constant that belongs to a data type, in our case, a view controller. So for example, I'm gonna zoom in again to this uh, detailed view controller. I want to create a property for this UI image view attached to the detail view controller, this thing here. To do that, Xcode will do all for us, it's very helpful. I go to the assistant editor, it's this button here. If you have an older version of OS X like Mavericks or an older version of Xcode, you might see like a, a tuxedo, a, a dinner jacket thing going on with a bow tie. It's two circles right now, um, but click it anyway, it's the same button. And your view splits in two. The top here is where we were, our view controller in the storyboard, the layout. And the bottom is the matching code. So detail view controller. That's this file here, detailviewcontroller.swift. This is the matching code, and it's it's a really, really helpful way to create properties. Because what you can do is you can say, listen, this UI image view, I want to reference it in code. I want to get a, a name for this, a variable for this, I can reference in code. And to do that, super simple, just select it, then hold down control and drag into the code. And you see this blue line appear. Somewhere inside the class, just let go of your mouse button, and this appears. It'll ask you for a name, so please write in detail image view, then press connect. So, Xcode has inserted a line of code for us, this line here, fantastic. To the left of it, it's got this circle with a ring around it. And that tells you there is a valid interface builder connection for this variable. If you hover over it, it highlights in the top pane. This bottom one, this detailed description label, well, that's got an empty ring because it hasn't got anything in interface builder anymore. We deleted that thing from interface builder. So we can in fact just delete that whole line of code now. It's not needed anymore. What we're left with is our new uh, image view in code. Let's have a look what this code actually means. First up, at IB outlet. So this thing is a connection from interface builder into source code. And at IB outlet, it's a magic keyword, it really means nothing. It goes away when the code's compiled. But Xcode can detect it and say, ha, this is obviously important inside our user interface. We need to reference that somewhere. And what it means is when you're working inside interface builder, you can say control drag from here to here, and you'll see detail image view as an option. If that was not at IB outlet, it wouldn't be detected by uh, um, Xcode and you wouldn't see it in there. So it's required for that case. Weak is a special keyword that means I don't really care if this thing goes away. I don't own it. Someone else owns it. I just want to reference it. In this case, this is perfectly fine because we know our view owns it. The thing, the thing that the image is inside, that view controller, owns it. We don't have to own it, which we're not reference to it. Var is how you do variables again. So you've seen let for constants, var is for variables. It's called detail image view, and it is a UI image view exclamation mark. It is what is technically called a uh, <laughs> implicitly unwrapped optional UI image view. Very technical way of saying it's an image view which might be there or it might not be, but it probably is. Now the reason it might not be there is actually quite important. You know, you cannot get away with doing that. It wouldn't work, even though it appears to work. Well, it doesn't even appear to work great. I, mean, I know why, but we'll get into that much, much, much later. Um, it needs to have an exclamation mark because when this thing is created, when your code is first run, it hasn't loaded this layout yet. View to load has not been called. This layout does not exist. So technically, this thing doesn't exist either. The, the name is still there, detail image view. It, it, it's, a, it's a variable, it exists as a variable, but there's nothing behind it. It is nil, it is null, it is empty, it does not exist. It's pointing some dead space and RAM. So that's why it starts life as being possibly nil. Now, as soon as the layout loads, fine. Then uh, Interface Builder connects up this layout to that variable and it's not nil anymore, fantastic. But to begin with, it can be nil. So you have to say it's an exclamation mark. Uh, you need to be careful. If you ever use a variable that's an exclamation mark variable like this, a, a um, implicitly unwrapped optional, uh, if you ever use it and it is nil, if it is dead, then your app will crash. You have to be very, very careful with that. So 
we have now connected the image view into our code and killed the old label code instead but we're seeing a slight problem if you look up here there's a warning one error there's a line down here a red line that means that's where the error is you can scroll down and have a look at what it's doing and it's telling you there's an error on this line of code because it's referencing detail description label uh, and it can't do that because we killed the label already now what's happening here is this code is inside a method a chunk of code called configure view and that's being called from up here so what we're seeing is a variable called detail item which is an any object question mark now you've seen exclamation marks already that's something a data type that might be nil might not be nil but let's face it probably isn't nil uh, it makes it much easier to reference because you can just assume it's there uh, a question mark is something that might be there or might not be there we genuinely don't know so you have to be very very careful with it so detail item is set by the master view controller when you click on stuff so if i'm here in my in my view i click on this object here that sets detail item and when that's set you see this code here did set open brace close brace and what this is called a property observer what it means is when this detail item is modified i.e it is set has been set execute all the code between that brace and that brace in this case it just calls self configure view so our detail item when it's set call this thing and that in turn updates the label which is now not working because the label no longer exists before we go any further let's look a bit more at this stuff self.configure view why is it self dot well self dot refers to the current object in this case it's our detail view controller um, and that used to be really important in objective c it used to basically be required um, if you want to be absolutely sure about your code uh, being memory safe you'd use self dot everywhere um, so a bit of a hangover from objective c having self everywhere and there are two camps one camp says you know uh, it's nice to be clear it's nice to be explicit i can't let go of objective c i must use self dot everywhere one camp says in swift there are a few times when using self dot is required this is not one of them therefore it kind of waters down the importance of it to use it everywhere so i'm going to delete it now i am in the latter camp i hate seeing self dot everywhere unless it really means something so i'm going to go ahead and delete these self dots because it makes me feel good fantastic that's exactly the same thing behind the scenes. I think it's changed. So when detail item has been set, this is called. Now, this method does a few interesting things. First up, it says if let detail any object equals detail item. This is a special way of accessing variables. So you've seen that detail item can be any object but we know it's a string so we can just change that to be string there you go string uh, but it's an optional string it might be there it might not be there we don't know and the way to find out is by unwrapping the optional asking it what do you have inside you give me your value if you have a value uh, and that's the easiest way of doing that is using this syntax here if let what happens is if let says look at this optional value detail item if it has a value anything unwrap it and put it inside detail here if it does not have a value then none of this code will be executed it'll skip on beyond it so it's a nice way of carefully unwrapping and continuing to use an optional variable but it happens twice first up we say if detail item has a value unwrap it put it in detail then if detail description label has a value unwrap it and put it in label now this is where it's erroring because that doesn't exist anymore we can change that to be detail image view and it'll work again uh, let's see let's rename label to be image view and instead of text of course text doesn't exist anymore we're going to just do nothing for a minute let's put in code here so first up it unwraps detail item have you got a value if so put it in here if that's the case then it unwraps detail image view have you got a value if so put it in here finally execute our code so this code here will only be executed if this thing and this thing are both true otherwise it will carry on past it so if we have an image to show 
and we have an image view in which to show it, what should we do? Well, ideally, we want to show the image. That's the point of this thing, right? So delete that code, and we're going to use image view dot image. Set the image of our image view. Image view being the unwrapped version of detail image view. Set the image of our image view to be a new image, and as a new class to do this. So you've seen uh, NS bundle, NS file manager. This thing is called UI image. So you've seen UI image view. This is UI image, and the view is important because a view is something you can see on the screen. A user can interact with on the screen. UI image has not got view in the end. This is not something you can actually see as a user. Instead, this is an abstract thing. It's just some image data. You've pointed at a, at a ping file or a JPEG or some other picture, and it's loaded it from disk. It's got it in there. It can't do anything with it, but you can use it elsewhere. In our case, we're going to take that image and put it inside our image view to show it. So to load a picture, you say UI image named. It's completing for me. Named. Then give it the name of a picture to load. We could, of course, write in quote nssl0033.jpg. Um, but that kind of defies the point because users have chosen one from our list. We should show them that one. So rather than typing in a file name, I'm going to use detail like that. And that is the unwrapped optional of our detail item. Now, you'll see here it's, it's the Xcode's built in code has said actually that's an any object. That isn't true. We know it's a string. It was an optional string. Now it's a real string. So you can just select that and delete it. And it means take this optional string, make it a real string. Take, an take this optional image view, make it a real image view. Then load that picture from disk and put it inside that image view. That's what that code does. Now, this is all called through the did set of our detail item, this property observer. And that is called from it being set inside master view controller. So when, when you are in the iOS simulator, you're sort of here, where you choose in the master view, then it sets detail item and pushes it in and does stuff. So if you look back in master view controller, I'll switch back to the normal editor for ease of, of viewing. Um, you'll see this method here, prepare for segue. Remember, it's segue, not seg or some other hideous pronunciation. This is called when we're about to transition from one view controller to another view controller, from our master view controller to our detail view controller. The, the detail's been created. It's now down to us to configure it. And uh, Apple has these two lines of code, badly indented, I'll just fix that, um, for us already. That they, they work, it does the job, but we can make it a bit nicer so you can understand what it's doing. I'm gonna hide this right-hand thing for a second so you can see more of what I'm doing. I'm going to press command forward slash to comment them out and I'll write it again in slightly easier to understand text. Uh, the first thing you want to do is get a handle on our detail view controller. So we're going to write uh, let detail view controller, create a new constant called detail view controller and make it equal to segue dot destination view controller as detail view controller. So what this is doing You'll see prepare for segue takes two, or it receives two parameters, the segue itself and who called it. Now, the segue contains information, a lot of information, such as identifier, what's happening, but also destination view controller. What is the thing that is being shown? And that could be any view controller in any iOS app ever, realistically. We don't know what kind of view controller it is. But that means we can't use it usefully in our application because we want to try and set its detail item property, but we can't because we don't know it's a detail view controller. That's where as detail view controller comes in. It's saying, listen, this is a view controller. You and I both know it. it's fine, but actually I want you to treat it as if it were a detail view controller. And what will happen is Swift will continue saying, actually, it's not a normal view controller. It's a detail view controller. So we can use it with special stuff. We're going to say uh, our detail view controller, lowercase d at the beginning, dot detail item. So I can actually I can actually set it and read its properties because it knows it's a detail view controller, not a normal view controller. So detail view controller the detail item equals objects bracket index path dot row. So the objects array we had earlier that's defined for us by the Xcode template. There it is up there, and we're adding things to it here index path 
that comes from Apple's code up here. So what's happening here is it's saying, uh, when we're about to segue from the master view controller to the detail view controller, ask the table view which we have for the index path of its selected row. Find out which row is selected, i.e. which row is tapped. And you get back this index path. Index path contains a section and a row for where something exists in a table. Sections we don't have in our, in our app, we only have one section. Um, but if you look at something like the contact app on your iPhone, you'll see the headings A, B, C, D, E, and so forth, while all the rows are people inside the letters. Uh, those, those letters are sections, inside them are rows. For us, we don't have sections, we can ignore that. We care about row. Which row was tapped? Find that row inside the objects array and pass that in as the detail item of our detail view controller. And when that's done, of course, it calls the did set, which configures a view, which does stuff. So that's how it all gets passed in. You can go ahead and run your code now. It'll build and run, and you'll see lots of pictures. Tap on one, there it is. With full rotation, fantastic. So it's kind of working now. You know, it, it, it works. It's not exactly award-winning, but it works. But there is one hiccup, and you can see it here. If I'm looking at this picture, NSL, NSSL0091.jpg, if I open that in Xcode, you'll see what it looks like, and I'll run the two side by side. There is Xcode, and there is our app. You can see it's, it's stretched, and this is how it should look. It's nice and wide, uh, this uh, evil tornado cloud thing. And here it's stretched, and it's even worse if you go to, to landscape mode, it's stretched again. Uh, that is the default behavior of image views. It's stretching the picture to fill the frame of the image view perfectly. We don't want to keep that, really. We want to make it fit uh, by design, uh, the space we've allocated for it, uh, without stretching it. And that's done by going back to main.storyboard, selecting the image view. I'll show this panel on the right again, because that's where the inspector lives. Uh, you'll see that across here, these are inspectors for this object you've selected. Uh, and this one here, the arrow with a line, is the attributes inspector. That's you'll be using that an awful lot, so make sure you find that. Uh, and we're going to change mode from scale to fill to be either aspect fit or aspect fill. I'll choose aspect fit for a moment, then press play. And now Xcode will ensure it maintains the proper aspect ratio of the picture inside the image view. If I choose 91 again, there we go. So you can see the whole picture. Now, of course, because it's maintained the aspect ratio, there's now tons of gap space on the bottom and top. And you might think, actually, I, I don't want that space. I want to fill that space fully without stretching it. And what will happen is the picture will become sort of yay big. It will overlap the edges of the, of the, of the view controller, um, which is fine. But it means it fills the space quite nicely, but you, you crop the edges, right? So we'll just change aspect fit to be aspect fill. And that will do that, but you'll get an unanticipated uh, side effect. So now if I choose 91, there's the picture. So it's cropping way tons of it off now, just fine. But it fills the screen much more nicely. But watch the animation. See, it kind of slides out and jutters part way. What's happening there is that uh, um, our picture is actually overlapping the area allocated to the view controller. It's bigger. You know, the image view is this big on the screen. But the picture goes way over the edges because it's not cropped. In Xcode, in Interface Builder, choose your image view and choose Clip Subviews, which means don't let the image leak out of this image view area. And when you do that and run the app again, it will work correctly. So this time you'll see, I can choose a picture. It's, it's cropped on the edges, but it fills the screen nicely and the animation looks great again. Personally, I'm a big fan of Aspect Fit, but use whatever makes you happy. So again, Aspect Fit, make sure the entire picture is visible if that, even if that includes space around it. The last thing we're going to do is make a small tweak to the code to make things much nicer um, because one of the cool things about iOS 8 is that it really helps developers uh, focus their apps on what matters. In this case, it's our pitch that matters. You know, everything else, you know, this bar, master, carrier, battery, signal, and time, doesn't really matter. We want to focus on the picture, big time picture focus. So we're going to make it so that uh, when you tap on the picture, it hides the bar entirely. So it really lets people focus on what's going on. And that's super simple to do in iOS 8. Go to Detail View Controller. We're going to add uh, two new methods that are called for us automatically by uh, iOS. So you've seen if you did load, 
which is called when the viewers finish loading, the layout's finished loading, go ahead and do stuff, which is fine. Um, we're gonna add two more, which are also automatically called by iOS 8. One is view will appear. Again, use code completion, view will appear. Press enter to complete. And the other one is called, oops, view will disappear. So view will appear is called whenever your view is about to be shown on the screen. This is your very, very last chance to do stuff before animation happens to make it show. Um, and in this then we're gonna set a property saying uh, we want to make it so when the picture's tapped, hide the bars. View will disappear is when you're about to be removed from the screen. Hasn't happened yet, you're about to be removed. And again, we want to use this to modify the way our, our bars are tapped to hide stuff. I'll put the code in uh, to see, and you can, you can have a think about it, and then I'll explain why it works that way. First up though, we are going to call super.viewWillAppear. Then pass in the animated parameter we're receiving ourselves. So we get told, is this thing be animated or not? We just pass that along to super. And then the same for view will disappear. So super view will disappear animated. Again, this code could do absolutely nothing. We don't really care what it does, but it's the right thing to do to let Apple say, hey, if you have anything to do beforehand, you do that first and then I'll do my stuff. So when our view is about to appear, we want to tell the navigation controller, when I am tapped, hide yourself. And this is super simple to do. You just say navigation controller dot hides bars on tap. Now watch carefully. Do you see it's got this uh, sort of period of the line over it in red here? When I hit enter for hides bar on tapped, this happens. A question mark appears and the red line goes away. Let's complete the line of code first. Hides bars on tap equals true. Then copy and paste that to disappear and make it false. So the question mark, this thing here, this is required because every view controller like this one or like this one that is inside a navigation controller, this bar at the top with the animation pushing and popping stuff, everything that's inside a navigation controller can reference that navigation controller using this property called navigation controller. But if you change your design tomorrow, or next week, or next year, so you are no longer inside an navigation controller, you delete that entirely and say, hey, I don't want it, get rid of it, then that property will no longer be true. It won't exist anymore, it'll be nil, it'll be nothing. You're not inside a navigation controller anymore. And that's what the question mark means. We may or may not have one, we don't know. With a question mark here, it means if we do have one, then, set its property hides bars on tap to be true. If we don't have one, it will do nothing. The option will say, well, don't exist, bail out, run away, do nothing. So it's a really safe way of making sure your code will only do things when you're really sure it needs to do so. So if you will appear, we're saying hides bars on tap, true. If you will disappear, hides bars on tap, false. And if you run your app now, you'll see what this does. So here's our, our picture view list. I can choose the tornado thing. I can go to landscape, say, I can tap on the picture. And automatically the bars go away. It does the right thing for us, even in portrait too. Now, the reason we have it in view will appear and view will disappear. This is an important thing because you want to keep your interface fairly sane for users. And if we took this out, if we didn't have a false here, we said to be true no matter what. Let's play it back again and see how that looks. So I'm, I'm gonna scroll around, I'm gonna click here at the bottom. Nothing happens, I'm not tapping in a row. I'll choose NSSL 042, great. There's a picture. Tap, hide, tap, show, fantastic. Back again, choose the next one. Whoa, hey, it panned it in, but the bar went as well. Why is that? Well, that's because hides bars on tap is still set to true. And we tap the screen. Now, selecting a row counts as tapping the screen. So let's go, uh, iOS goes, well, I better hide the bars. And it's a really disconcerting user experience. You know, you want, you want things to stay where they were. Um, and so that's why when our detail view will go away, view will disappear is called, we have this hides, on bar, hides bars on tap back to be false again meaning that the expected behavior kicks in again. So I can run it again, tap anywhere I like, doesn't do anything, show 45, tap, sh hide, tap, show, hide, show, go back again, and it works correctly. 
So it, it enables it only when it's required. Otherwise, it's a very jolting user experience. That ends your app. That's your first app finished. I know there's a huge amount of dross to get through for what looks like a very simple app. You know, this app does not do very much. But you have learned about constants and variables. You have learned a little about table views and image views, app bundles, NS file manager, some typecasting. That's the as detailed view controller stuff. You've done a loop. You've done some optionals. You've got view controllers. You've got storyboards. You've got outlets. You've got a little bit of auto layout. You've got UI image. In this one project, which really is a, it's a dummy project wrapped around tons of learning, You've got a lot of information behind you. And don't worry if you're thinking, crikey, I remember only a tenth of this stuff. That's okay. 10% is amazing. Well done. Watch the next tutorial. We'll do it again. We'll do some more, another project to help you relearn it and relearn it and relearn it until it totally sinks in. Remember, for more information, go to the website, hackingwithswift.com. There you can find the books for this series on sale just for a few dollars. Uh, and the book, goes into so much more information about optionals and view controllers and uh, bundles and more auto layouts. Have a look at the book. It is just three bucks. Uh, and for more information, you can also buy the videos of this in high resolution. If you have any questions or you just want to get in touch, please follow me on Twitter. Uh, I am at two straws. Otherwise, I will see you on hackingwithswift.com.